before we begin uh, with the questions from our audience, let me start by getting something straight. Who exactly are migrants and who are refugees? Excellent question. Uh, refugees, for them there's a specific definition in international law. There's a 51 convention relating to the uh, status of refugees, which very specifically defines who is a refugee. Mm -hmm. Then there's also a regional agreement in Africa, which states that refugees, even if they're in groups and move uh, for armed conflict reasons, etc., uh, should be recognized as refugees. Uh, so that's specific international law. For migrants, we do not have similar strong international uh, definition grounded in international law. But uh, we do know, for example, uh, the population scientists and statisticians, when we have to count an international migrant, we look at persons who are changing their country of residence. And that means regardless of status, regardless of the reason for migration. So most refugees are in other countries, they cross an international border, so when we count migrants, the refugees will be automatically included. And so uh, there are actually, uh, so there are differences because refugees move for specific reasons. There are also commonalities mm. and one such a commonality is human rights because every person, whether they move or not, mm. or whether they move for a specific reason, mm. all have basic human rights. Mm. Thank you. And you both specialize in migration data. How can data help real people making desperate and sometimes very dangerous passages? Thank you. That's, of course, the, the question that goes to our hearts and our heads as population scientists. Our uh, data can help at every stage in the process of, slight, uh, of flight of people seeking refuge and safe haven, either within their countries as internally displaced persons, but clearly when they cross, as Bela says, cross an international border and become recognized by international agencies. For those agencies and organizations to effectively use those resources, they need to know numbers. They, it sounds forensic, Mm -hmm. But it will help that mother and her child mm -hmm. if an organization such as the UNHCR mm -hmm. or Save the Children mm -hmm. know how many people they need to serve and what their characteristics are. Mm -hmm. And a very important indicator of vulnerability mm -hmm. or need is age, age and gender. Mm -hmm. So at the most fundamental level, at the very moment of mm -hmm. flight, the numbers can be helpful to any individual person mm. and then over the course of their lives as they look as as forced migrants look for safe haven asylum or perhaps permanent resettlement um, uh, demographic and population data can help provide those resources and services to support the experience mm. and keep people safe mm. important work yeah, if I can just add one example, Absolutely. for example, yeah. if, if refugees return mm. to the country, most refugees return to their own country mm. actually, having a good demographic profile mm. uh, at the moment of displacement mm. is very important, not only to see logistically mm. how to move people from uh, back to their country, mm. but also in terms of reception uh, needs at the reception mm. and the reintegration mm. and the development, mm. the characteristics, the base and age and gender is the first mm. uh, aspect of the composition of the population. Mm. Very important because obviously if you have a young population, you need many schools. Mm. If you have older populations, yeah. you need other types of services. Yeah. So it's very much the demographic profile is very much driving the needs of, of refugees and returnees, I would say. Yeah, yeah. We actually have uh, a question from the online audience. Thank you for posting. Gabrielle is asking, how many migrants are there in the world today and what are the trends? Excellent question. Mm. Well, the uh, the uh, measures of the uh, major refugee organizations, the International Organization for Migration and the UN High Commissioner for Refugees estimates that there are 65 million people of concern throughout the world. Mm. And that would include refugees, mm. as well as persons seeking asylum mm. whose, whose application has not been fully recognized yet, but mm. clearly mm. are recognized as being in need of safe haven, mm. internally displaced persons um, who have been have 
had to leave their homes within the mm. borders of their own country. Mm. So it's the highest under those, I believe, under those two agencies, that's the highest number we've mm. witnessed, but it certainly is comparable mm. to the post-Second World War era mm. uh, in terms of the scale of the issue. Mm. So that is the forced displacement component with mm. about 25 million of them are uh, refugees of those 65 mm. but if you look at the total number of international migrants mm. we estimate that it's about 258 million today mm. which represents about 3.4 percent of the global population okay so despite all the news most people are not an international migrant 96.6 percent mm. of the population is living in their own country mm. and the trends you asked for the trends yes, yes. thank you for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so you can see actually that as a proportion of total population mm. the share of international migrants is going up Mm. but very slowly. You can mm. actually not see a very strong rise there, although you have to say the 3.4% is a global average and in mm. some countries, yeah. in the highly mm. industrialized countries, you can see percentages of about 15-16% yeah. on average. Yeah. Mm. Could I add to that? Yeah. I, I, what, Bela, what you've just said I think is so key is that there is such a geography mm. to, I mean I'm in a department of geography so I have to kind of bring in the spatial dimension, but there's such unevenness in mm. terms of, of need and response, there's mm. such differences mm. and that's Uh, that's a challenge for mm. the international community in terms of response, mm. uh, but something that uh, uh, we uh, is very important to keep in mind mm. is that the share of immigrants per resident population, mm. as well as the responsibility sharing yeah. in terms of refugees, is very is different. very yeah. different from yeah. one country to the next. And we have uh, another question from Mary Lou is asking: Is there any difference between the data you collect? for migrants and the refugees. Is there a difference uh, between the data that you collect for these groups? Um, so yes, there is a difference because uh, the difference on the, uh, if we look at the total number of migrants, that is the persons who are living in another country than they were born, mm. uh, that's mostly coming from the population censuses, which, which most countries hold about once every 10 mm. years. Mm. And for some countries, uh, in Europe in particular, you can also look at the population register. Mm. register. But we do not know among those international migrants who of them are the refugees. Mm. So they're generally included, but they are not mm. separately identified. For that, we go actually to the office of the UN Refugee Agency, mm. because they have a mandate to collect the statistics from countries to support mm. their work on protecting refugees. You cannot mm. protect refugees if you don't have the basic data. Mm. Yeah. So what do they collect that data, they have it from the camps, they have it mm. from the asylum authorities, authorities, mm. from the ministries, and that's where you get the number of 225 mm. million refugees from mm. that uh, yeah. Alan was talking about. Mm. Mm. And another question from Gordon. Gordon is asking, is the UN doing, and what is the UN doing uh, anything to stop illegal migration around the world? Is, what, is the UN doing anything to stop yeah. illegal migration around the world? Right. Certainly, uh, migration has become a very important topic uh, for the General Assembly and for mm. the United Nations. Uh, and uh, just two years ago, the General Assembly agreed that it would adopt what they call now a global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration. Clearly, they've recognized that much of current migration, not the majority, mm. but there's a, a lot of people who are suffering during flights, there's irregular migration, disorganized migration, mm. unplanned, very difficult to mm. predict. Mm. Although we do know that there are needs mm. in labor markets, for example. So the effort now of the General Assembly is actually to come up with what they call well-managed migration policies, mm. more predictability, mm. where migration would be safer more orderly and more regular. Mm. I don't know where you want to add. Um, mm. And clearly the uh, international community and international law recognizes sovereignty mm. uh, for countries to regulate in, uh, migration into their borders. Mm. And so there is a real uh, uh, um, respect for national sovereignty, but there's mm. also a recognition mm. that there are needs to increase the, mm. the avenues for mm. safe, regular, Uh, migration mm. uh, for uh, to promote economic development as mm. well as to protect the livelihoods mm. of, of migrants. Mm. Mm. And Tong is is asking also, 
Why should developed countries accept migrants? What, what's in it for? Why, why is it? Uh, what's in it for developed countries? Right. That's an excellent question. Let me mm. give two examples where why it matters. Mm. First, is we see there's a fact that not all the needs in the labor markets, mm. whether it's unskilled, semi-skilled, or highly skilled, can be covered by mm. national populations. Mm. So we see, for example, that very often in countries mm. that uh, uh, farm work or work in the healthcare sector mm. or in IT, for example, we, there are not a sufficient nationally trained people. Mm. So that is not so, that's really the labor market. The employers need that mm. and, and the people are asking mm. the products mm. to which those migrants contribute. So mm. it's really, I think, a reality of labor mm. markets. That's yeah. one thing. For the refugees, we call it responsibility sharing because mm. Alan was already alluding to the fact that mm. most refugees are actually hosted mm. by the poorest countries in the mm. world. Mm. And so they have already limited opportunities for educating and caring for their own people. And mm. then they have the responsibility to provide asylum to sometimes hundreds of thousands, if not mm. millions of mm. forcibly displaced persons. Mm. So one major, uh, and, and so the, the richer countries are asked to help not only by resettling some of them, but in particularly also to helping mm. provide the resources to help the mm. ref to help the host countries there care for refugees. Mm. And we have a question also. Thank you, everyone, for <laughs> posting all these questions. Question. Great. Yeah, Abraham is asking, what is the plan for immigrants from or migrants from climate disaster and climate crisis victims? Um, uh, can the UN can the UN push the governments to do more mm -hmm. about them, to do more for them? I guess also. Um, I, I think we would both agree that this is, that is of an issue and mm. a set of issues, mm. a complex set of issues, mm. uh, very high on the the, the UN agenda. Mm. Uh, that. Uh, Climate-induced or environmentally-induced migration is something that we actually can predict. We know kind of where and when, and how these patterns are likely to unfold. Mm. That gives us an opportunity to think about issues mm. of mitigation mm. and prevention and and um, uh, uh, support for people who uh, to allow them not to have to move if mm. that's the case. Mm. If if uh, with environmental change. Mm. The issue is very, very high on the, the agenda for the Global Compact mm. uh, to think again about uh, sharing, but also thinking about infrastructure mm. and local and regional responses mm. to these needs of, of uh, displacement that may result particularly from coastal areas if, mm. if we're thinking mm. about climate change mm. and, and global warming, mm. but also thinking more broadly about other sources of environmental change associated mm. with mm. Um, land use change and agricultural cycles mm. that are likely to shift mm. with increasing temperatures. Mm. Um, this is where we have wonderful partnerships between social scientists and uh, natural scientists mm. and putting our modeling capabilities together. Mm. Mm. We have another question from Malik. Could illegal migration to developed countries be a potential threat to the national security of those countries? Could illegal, yeah, illegal right. migration, yeah. It is certainly a fact that uh, what we call an irregular migration or mixed flows of refugees and migrants mm. in large movements as we have seen in the past years mm. Are certainly a concern for for host countries and mm. that is why they are responding there are economic effects there are social mm. effects and certainly there are also mm. security effects i think mm. and that is why i think for everyone not just mm. for those countries but also the mm. human security the, the the human rights for the migrants themselves are better served if they can move in an orderly yes. mm. and in a more predictable and in a regular mm. fashion mm. and so uh, that is i think uh, we we see uh, and and one important element in this i mm. think is, is better information on, on the number of migrants, mm. but mm. not just on the challenges that they present, but mm. also on the contributions that they mm. bring, not mm. only for uh, destination countries, mm. but also for countries of origin. There are mm. millions of families who are dependent on remittances, for example. Mm. And so 
uh, it's very uh, supportive of development efforts in developing countries. There are hundreds of millions of families who have really moved out of poverty because of remittances, because of the productive use and investment of those remittances. So we have to make sure that we take all those aspects into account when we talk about migration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Faisal is asking about the UN support for international placed people by climate change. Can you share anything about what the UN is doing in terms of internet? supporting international displaced people as a cause of, of climate change? Well, yeah, Ellen was referring to mm. the important driver of migration being mm. climate change and, and mm. environmental mm. factors. And I think now that there has actually been a state-led initiative, mm. we call it the, the Nansen Initiative, mm. where outside the United Nations countries have come together and say, mm. You know, we have to try to see what do we do with people who are displaced, mm. in particular who cross international borders because mm. of those factors, mm. but who do not fall under the existing refugee definition. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's not that legally those refugees do not fall currently mm. under the international law instruments, mm. but they are certainly thinking ahead because we know that there will be mm. significant effects yeah. of climate change to see mm. how those people fleeing those effects mm. can be accommodated in the mm. future. And I just add to that one of the uh, you know I I'm a bystander in, in terms of the United Nations but what I observe is in terms of a real a true strength mm. of the United Nations is its regional capabilities it has such a strong system of regional commissions mm. uh, and its major offices and organizations are very much grounded in regional dynamics and that's where climate change mm. is going to play out mm. within particular regions yeah. and there i think the united nations has the best or has very good mm. you know kind of administrative infrastructure mm. to leverage the assets in, in particular regions because yeah. yeah. what will happen in central america mm. will not be appropriate what happens mm. in on the coast to, uh, you know in bangladesh mm. so the regional context that's a phrase that's being used a lot this week, mm. context specific. Mm. And there the unit of analysis I would say would be the region. Yeah, yeah. We, we're we actually uh, getting close to, we need to wrap up because you two are <laughs> heading to the 16th coordination meeting on international migration that actually started today. Yep. And you're just uh, about to join the That's afternoon right. session. But one last question about this meeting now that started today on international migration. How will it help people on the ground? Excellent question. Be this is a meeting where we have civil society coming, where we have member states coming, where we have international agencies coming. And we hope to put the best information forward to these countries that are negotiating these legal agreements mm. on migration and refugees. Mm. And certainly once adopted, they will have an impact in the country. So mm. yes, it's in New York, mm. but these agreements will be adopted nationally and then implemented. It's all about the implementation. Mm. And, and so one of the things we are discussing actually this afternoon is look at the implementation of these yeah. compacts yeah. because mm. that is really key. Otherwise, it just remains a letter mm. on paper. That's very true. Thank you. Yeah, did you want to add anything? I would just also? say that we are in a new world, yes, in terms of mm. migration, mm. but among the leadership worldwide, there is mm. such a demand mm. for evidence mm. that our policies must be informed by good science. Mm. And that is very important, it's profound, and it's very exciting. Mm. Thank you so much to both of you for joining. Thank you to all of you for watching us today, for sharing so many questions. We will share under this uh, broadcast a link to where you can find more information about the meeting happening now on international migration. This meeting is also webcast, so you can actually follow what you're going to be discussing right. during these two days. UN so we will TV. UN TV. So we will post that link as well. Uh, thank you again. Thank you for joining yeah. us.